there are so many underappreciated vegetables out there that unfortunately, most people who follow a strict mainstream modern diet will never get to try out. To their own detriment, these plants boast exotic flavors and new textures. They are also packed with nutrients to boost your health. Salsify is one of these. It's a delicious root crop with a divine flavor. It has been considered a delicacy vegetable in the past, yet in today's supermarket, you will be hard pressed to find it. You might even think there's a big conspiracy to keep it from the people. But don't grab your tinfoil hat just yet. Salsify is kept from general consumption because of simple economics. If you want to try it or enjoy it frequently, you might just have to grow it yourself. I'm here to share with you my experience growing salsify for the first time. I'm Siloe Oliveira. Finding and cultivating obscure vegetables forgotten by modern culture is one of my hobbies as I grow more food for flavor in my suburban homestead. I had a bit of extra garden space taken over by ground ivy and some random irises in a nice sunny place. I wanted to try growing salsify. I got the idea to try it when browsing the seed offerings of a local Baltimore seed house that has been in business for the last century. The seed package described it as oyster plant due to its delicate flavor. I was curious. I had to clear ground to grow it though. Much like carrots or the more obscure yet still found in grocery stores parsnip, salsify will want good loose soil to develop well, but it doesn't seem to be too fussy. This site had bulb irises growing that flowered unreliably. I wanted to use the space for something more productive, but I didn't want to kill the iris outright. So I decided to use a garden fork to move the bulbs to less desirable garden real estate. That way, if the iris wanted to continue living and thriving, it would need to work for it. Moving bulbs while the leaves are still green is completely not recommended. It's best to do this once the leaves wither and turn brown. That takes some time and I didn't want to wait. So I was being as careful as I could within reason. I decided to move the iris to under the grapevines. It was up to the iris bulbs to be resilient and survive. Using a shovel, I dug a shallow trench deep enough to accommodate the iris bulbs. Although I cut up some of the grapevine roots in the process, I know that this won't hurt the vine at all. Grapevines are very resilient to being pruned. I grabbed the iris bulbs and placed them in the trench, spacing them about 6 inches from one another. These plants will get some shock from the premature relocation. However, bulbs store enough energy to make the plant survive this rough treatment. After placing the bulbs in the right spot, I covered them with soil. Hopefully, these will flower next year but I'm not counting on it. Using a metal rake, I go about removing what is left of the ground ivy that so efficiently covered the soil. To ensure vibrant growth, I'm amending the soil with composted manure and humus. I added two 40 pound bags to this bed. Store bought fertilizer is still a resource I use, but one of my long term goals is to be less dependent on outside products and produce my garden's fertility within my own land. As I've shown previously, I also use a bit of concentrated organic fertilizer that is rich in naturally occurring minerals as well. Mixing the soil well using a garden fork should provide an ideal growing media for the salsify root.
I started salsify seeds indoors a few weeks before in the usual manner I raised seeds and have shared in previous episodes. I put them to harden outside while I got their growing space ready. Besides salsify, I'm planting tomatoes and chard and a few quick growing lettuce. Since I have limited sun exposed space, I try to cram as many vegetables as I can. Because growing salsify this time is a novelty for me, I'm not devoting too much space for it. I decided to plant it in the edge of the bed where it could eke out some sunlight once the tomatoes started to dominate the growth area. I knew they would. Nothing can stop tomato plants, especially sprawling cherry tomato vines. I also planted salsify in another bed, also dominated by tomatoes. While I was curious but doubtful about salsify, I could count on tomatoes. Salsify grows slowly. Although I'm sure they do best when in full sun, unencumbered by entitled garden staples like tomatoes. In the end of the growing season, when frost had killed all that was green and of tropical descent, I went about scavenging for the lonely salsify roots. Their leaves resembled clumps of hair. All I needed to do was to carefully pull them up with the help of my trusty garden fork to reveal the edible roots. Salsify can be rather long and thin and has a tendency of snapping. I was surprised to find my roots kinked and bent in weird corners. That's when I realized that raising the seedlings in cups was not one of my brightest ideas. For sure, the juvenile taproot had quickly reached the bottom of the cups and contorted itself into weird shapes. Learn from my mistake. Unless you're trying to grow pretzels, do not start salsify indoors in pots. Like most roots, salsify must be direct sown into the ground. If you really want to kickstart the germination process, you can pre-sprout them indoors and plant them outside as soon as roots poke through, just as I showed with growing peas and carrots. But from what I noticed, salsify germinates easily, so direct sowing dry seed will work just fine. Sometimes the old way of doing things is the best way. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I was eager to taste this vegetable oddity so I plopped the roots into the sink and started to methodically wash away the soil. One of the reasons why salsify may not be widely available in groceries may be that there is a good amount of washing to be done, since the roots are thin and full of nooks and crannies. It may be a convenience thing, or perhaps these roots don't store well, so the fresh eating is the only option. Without enough demand, there won't be a supply. After washing, I cut the roots into small segments. I found the simplest traditional way of eating these roots online and the recipe called for pre-boiling then sautéing. So I dropped the root pieces into a few cups of water that I had salted. I let the roots boil over until fork tender. That took a few minutes. I took them out of the heat and drained away the water. Into a skillet, I poured about a tablespoon of olive oil and dropped the drained roots, sautéing everything until the edges were starting to turn brown. It had a really different smell to it. 
Hard to describe, but it was a pleasant one. A bit of cracked pepper and salt to taste, and this is just a great natural snack. The taste was incredible. This is definitely a plant to continue growing in the future. Now, usually the journey of a vegetable ends at the table, but in this case, salsify serves a secondary purpose. Because it is biannual, it flowers in the second year. I let some of my plants in the ground over winter, and come spring, they sent up a profusion of daisy-like purple blooms. The plant itself, besides the blooms, holds interest. The spiky structure and bluish-green hue makes it a great addition to any edible landscape. Planted in masses and borders would give a spectacular effect. But what makes it a jewel in a landscaper's palette, in my opinion, is when after closing up and setting seed, they open up into giant, tan, airy globes, much like a dandelion, but improved. This is the stage when the plant becomes ethereal, conjuring images of long-lost summers and childhoods. Of course, they spread their seeds through the air. And being entrepreneur seed makers, their aerial strategy pays off. They are prolific. Many would consider them weeds, but their beauty and flavor makes me more excited about their resilience. It's strange that not many know this plant, but I hope that with this video, I've opened up a few eyes. Join me next time for another garden adventure. Remember to send your questions and comments to seedofchoice at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe to Suburban Homestead.